Aloha and welcome to Figments on Reality. I'm Dan Leaf and I go by Fig, thus the name of this show. It's season one, episode two. Now, those are totally arbitrary uh, designations. I don't know how I'll define a season, but it just sounds cool. So I do it. And as you can see, today's episode, we're going to talk about good and evil in cyberspace. But first, let's talk about what I'm trying to do here so you know what to expect if you haven't seen it before. This is going to be a non-political discussion, and I'm going to try to avoid vitriol. Okay, I have an aversion to politics. They're important, and I exercise my politics at the ballot box. But I'd like to give you things to think about, not what to think. So if you have alternate views or want to disagree or have a debate, Drop me a line at info at phase-one.com and we can have a conversation. So today on episode two, I'm going to start a new feature on Figments on Reality called Come On, Man, on Reality. From the news, I'll find stories that just make me roll my eyes and say, come on, man. Yes, I did take this from a popular NFL pregame show, but I think it still works here. So my first come on, man comes from the Chinese government saying that Japan was playing politics by providing much needed uh, vaccines, COVID vaccines, to the island of Taiwan. Now, since China claims Taiwan as a province and as part of their territory, and uh, the US and the world community have largely acceded to that view, why aren't they providing vaccines? And who's playing politics? If you look at the, the Chinese use of vaccines of some questionable effectiveness across the globe, they're the ones playing politics. So come on, man, get real. The other uh, come on, man, for today comes from a public service announcement that I recently saw that said that there are already more disposable masks, COVID-type masks, in the ocean than jellyfish. Now, first of all, uh, we ought to be careful about how we dispose of everything that might go in the ocean, including masks. And we try to limit our use here at home and break the strings on them so they don't get entangled in sea life if they wind up in the ocean. But how do they know, first of all, how many jellyfish there are in the ocean? Who counted them? And furthermore, how do they know how many masks are in the ocean? So, yeah, I. Like I said, I agree with the concept, let's keep stuff out of the ocean that doesn't belong in the ocean. Uh, but who makes this stuff up? And that's what it is made up. And I don't know if that's fake news or made up news, but it's not helpful to use hyperbole that simply can't be supported scientifically. Uh, and I say it can't because of my own experience with jellyfish. There's a lake in Palau, and this comes from my travel experience, Jellyfish Lake. It's on the a small island of Eli Malk in Palau. And I went there a few years ago during my travel with the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies and went to Jellyfish Lake. And they put you on um, a boogie board and you kind of face down, actually you're on a, a, an inflatable life jacket so you don't sink into the jellyfish. And the guide directs you to swim in a certain direction and the guidance was, really exactly this. The uh, swim in this direction until you see 100 jellyfish, then keep going. When you see 1,000 jellyfish, keep going. When you see a million jellyfish, you're there and just stop and enjoy the view. <laughs> Mil millions of golden jellyfish migrate across this lake every day, according to Wikipedia. And of course, we believe Wikipedia. So how do we know how many millions of jellyfish there are in the ocean? I don't know. Come on, man. Don't make stuff up. Make your point without baloney. Uh, so that's come on, man, on reality for today. I'll tell you in a bit why I thought we'd make this Cyber Monday on Figments. Uh, but first of all, we had a family discussion last night over dinner. Alejandra and Alejo and I talking about the good and evil of cyberspace and how it influences, and I've got my notes from it, but it was such a far ranging discussion, really good as always, that I, I won't go into detail, but there is good and evil in cyberspace. 
to understand that, I guess I should define cyberspace by the way I see it. And it's really this digital environment where we can do lots of things, some good and some evil. One of the first things we have is connectivity, both as individuals and collective and collectively. Facebook, social media, it really goes beyond that email, all of the ways you can connect with people, with companies, with your interests uh, are truly remarkable and generally positive. Uh, another area that the cyberspace has changed human life is the access to information, some of it real. Uh, but you can find anything you need. I don't take on a home improvement project without finding a video on YouTube that tells you how to do it. Why learn the hard lessons if somebody's already learned them? And we built a fence yesterday, a little privacy fence on our property. I should say Alejo built it. He did an awesome job, uh, but it started with research on the web. So you can find how to build something, how to cook something, how to buy something, all there in a manner uh, in, with accessibility that simply did not exist in years gone by. And I think that's good. You can express yourself personally. Uh, I'm doing that right now. I mean, 20 years ago, I couldn't have had a show like this without uh, the, the cyberspace presence of Think Tech Hawaii, a great organization. And I couldn't have gotten out and shared my views with you. Now, some of those views that are shared are frankly hateful and thus evil. Uh, so it's not all good, but we have a chance to express our views uh, in ways that we didn't have. But the one that caught my mind and the reason that I'm talking about uh, good and evil in cyberspace today is some, an article I found from Newsweek online about drastic. You can see what drastic is there. The decentralized radical autonomous search team investigating COVID-19. Now, they weren't always called that, and it's not as formal. Uh, it's not an organization. It's a collective, if you will, of interested parties, researchers, cyber sleuths, and other folks who uh, were curious about the origins of the COVID-19 virus. And sharing through Twitter, they got a cyber collective established and shared ideas and accessed information available online. And as you can see, Newsweek says that they uh, kind of shamed the mainstream media into uh, looking more deeply and giving more credibility to the potential that the virus came out of the Chinese lab in Wuhan. Now, I don't know if it did or not. I'm not advocating that view, but it is plausible. And it was largely dismissed for a long time until this crowd dug into things, including Chinese data of, in published research papers that they found in a Chinese website. So despite the official party denials that it could have possibly emanated from the lab, uh, there were papers that showed both by the nature of the virus and the actions that were and weren't taken that it might have. I really recommend that you look at that Newsweek article and read the detail because it shows how they laboriously sought the information, translated it, correlated it on Twitter, of all things, and uh, built now a, a organization that has a bit more structure. And as you've seen in the past week, uh, that's making the mainstream media, the traditional media, look more closely at this theory. Again, I'm not advocating a conclusion. I'm just saying that this group, drastic, through hard work and cyber sleuthing they could only do in our digital environment, um, kind of change the thinking on an issue that's very important if we're going to avoid such pandemics in the future. And my goodness, I certainly hope we are able to avoid those. The next topic I'd like to talk about, so read that article. I highly recommend it. Newsweek doesn't pay me. This is a non-commercial show, as hopefully you know. At least I don't think I'm getting paid for it. But um, the next area of interest to me in cyberspace is the evil side of it. And it uh, has to do with 
systems control and data acquisition. Yes, I did look down at my notes to make sure I got that right. It's normally called SCADA. It's a, SCADA is a collection of software and hardware that enables processes like managing a pipeline, for example, or running a plant or organizing stoplights so that in theory, they're sequentially uh, green, et cetera, to make traffic flow better. Then they're used on small and grand scales throughout the world. And really it was probably one of the, the first major, first manifestations of our digital environment uh, in, in the evolution of cyberspace. And the problem is that SCADA systems, and the hardware and software are vulnerable to attack. And we've seen that lately. And the first one I'll talk about is the colonial pipeline attack, which is back in the news again. Um, and in the uh, colonial pipeline attack, it's a huge pipeline. I, I had no idea. It takes uh, fuel, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, all the way from Texas as far uh, northeast as New York. And about 45% of the fuel consumed on the East Coast of the United States uh, is shipped by the colonial pipeline, as you probably are aware. Uh, this pipeline and its SCADA systems suffered a ransomware attack, uh, attack that impacted the SCADA management of it. And the Colonial Pipeline Company had, had to halt all of the pipeline's operation to contain the attack. Now, why was this done? Was this some nefarious um, nation state trying to uh, hurt the United States? No, it was for money. And that's what the attackers have said they did it for money. They requested and received a ransomware or a, a ransom of $4.4 million, I think in Bitcoin, within several hours of the attack. They sent, uh, the, the hackers sent the Colonial Pipeline folks a software fix. It worked very slowly, but uh, life, not just fuel, but life on the East Coast was significantly impacted for days. And you can imagine if it were longer, or let's say they misengineered their fix and uh, the pipeline didn't come back up. That has great importance to your average person on the street, but it also has national security importance to it. The good news is that I just saw a headline, I haven't read beyond this, that uh, the government has retrieved two million of the four point four million dollar ransom that was paid. Uh, so, hack number one, actually one of many, but one of the most visible ones. The second hack shows the global nature of both economy and cyberspace. JBS, a meatpacking company for, uh, headquartered in Brazil, serves over 110 countries largest meatpacking company in the world. Well, they were targeted in late May as well. And that shut down slaughterhouses from Australia to Canada to the US. Uh, it uh, stood down uh, over 10,000 workers, basically put them temporarily out of work and will continue to affect meat supply. And if you wonder about second order or cascading effects, it's likely to drive meat prices up and, up and supply down in Hawaii as the effects ripple down the supply chain. Uh, so that affects everybody. Again, mostly a personal economic impact, but with potential national security uh, implications over time. I don't just say that. The FBI director, Christopher Wray, uh, said that the agency is investigating over 100 different kinds of, um, of malware, ransomware uh, throughout. And he compared, if we could go back to slide four, he compared these attacks to the threat posed by 9-11 and said that this is a shared responsibility countering these ransomware attacks. Uh, shared responsibility, not just across government agencies, but across the private sector and even the average American. I'd kind of put that in reverse order. It starts with the average American. You can't buy food for your family because, because the shelves are bare. That's kind of where it starts. But then the responsibility goes to the businesses to, to, to protect themselves from 
uh, ransomware and, and build safeguards into the system to the government to inform businesses of the threat that's out there and enable their response to them as much as possible. But let's take Director Ray's comments a little more. This is 9-11. I was in the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001. Maybe I'll talk about that more some other time. And I saw the response and it was a military response. So if this is that big a threat, does that mean at some point a nation, the United States or another nation, will have to execute a military response against a non-state ransomware attack? In other words, something uh, the, the meatpacking hack was attributed to Russian private hackers with maybe the government looking the other way, but does a regular, a real, kinetic, nasty, violent, ugly war start from cyber crime? Hmm, worth considering and, and not uh, and a question that has a myriad of not just legal implications, but moral implications. And I'll throw in a word for my conscience and say that I think it's become too easy to find reasons to apply military force. And I regret that more on that, maybe again some other time. But really, does the is the United States going to execute a cyber or other attack against a non-state malware provider? I don't know. We need to think about that. Um so. Let's take a breath, take a break, because I will get back to good uh, that's there in cyberspace. In a second, let me give a word for my other show. Alternating weeks, we have Figments, The Power of Imagination. And in the next show, a week from today at 2 p.m. Hawaii time, today being Monday, the 7th of June. I'm sorry, I know these are often viewed after the fact. I'll have my great friend, Lieutenant Colonel Required, retired uh, Greg Slick Aguirre, uh, one of the best pilots ever, and certainly one of the most pilots in terms of flying and what he's flown ever. He dreamt he could fly and fly and fly. And you'll hear his amazing and very humble story uh, next week on Figments, The Power of Imagination. So next, let's talk about art artificial intelligence, something that is very powerful, a, a notion that's very powerful, machines that learn, that learn like humans, from humans, that could take over the world, perhaps. And there is some, some fear of the role of artificial intelligence, but uh, it can be good as well. And it's best artificial intelligence, intelligence, in my experience, when it's used to enable human magic. I don't, maybe I'm naive, I don't think so, but I don't believe that machines or artificial intelligence are able to or intended to replace humans. I do think they can enable human magic because the magic, and we see it every day in the people we meet, people we see on TV or whatever, uh, we see the magic of the human mind. And I don't think you can zero and one that into digital form. I do think that artificial intelligence can learn. Let me give you an example from my experience uh, that about how I think artificial intelligence should be used. Believe it or not, for a couple of years, I was a member of the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board as a retired Air Force guy, and at that time, a defense industry uh, object, uh, executive. And it was a, there were 40 people on this board, all of them smarter than me, uh, scientists, engineers, really brilliant people trying to help the Air Force solve its problem. I was there to provide comic relief, I think. Remarkable organization, and we would do summer studies where these all of these unpaid volunteers would get together and look at a tough problem. One summer, we looked at a problem that was kind of data driven, and uh, I can't go into detail, but the the problem was, folks in the military had access to so much data that they needed to assess and act upon in real time that they were swamped by it. And there was a technological solution of sorts to it. But what I witnessed, what I found, was that the um, solution was intended to enable the machines. The approach, the fundamental approach that the uh, 
uh, engineers and acquisition community had taken was, well, let's make the machines work better. No, let's make the machine. And the humans were there to enable the machines working better. And in my mind, that's the reverse of how it should work. Free up the humans from tasks that they don't do or don't do well to apply their reason, their rationale, and their morality to make good decisions quickly. And there's nowhere, that, and so I think that's the good of artificial intelligence. And it can be used that way. And probably there's, and I think there's no um, endeavor where it has more potential than in education and learning. And as if you've seen Figments on Reality, season one, episode one, uh, and I've commented on it otherwise, I was not a good learner. I had trouble learning. And that's because we all learn differently. And uh, the traditional way of teaching didn't reach me. Now, some of it was because I was because I was a knucklehead as a young person, maybe still now, but uh, a lot of it was that the mode didn't fit the way I learned. And I think I've proven I can learn stuff since then. So I work for an adaptive learning company as a paid senior advisor. And this is the disclaimer. It's not a commercial for the company that I think very highly of. It's for the thinking of using artificial intelligence to enable that human uh, magic in the learning environment. The company is called Serigo. It's a memory management and adaptive learning company. Google it. You're not going to buy directly from it because that's not how they work. They provide their learning platform right now to higher uh, institutions of higher education, to businesses that have to train or educate, and the area that I work in, government and military. And it's being used in in teaching folks who are learning dentistry or neuroscience, as well as how to run the high-speed rail system in Japan or how to fly F-15E fighters in the US Air Force. So it can be used to teach anything. And the reason it's so powerful is that it, it employs artificial intelligence end-to-end -end, from creating the learning material to presenting it and refreshing it uh, to assessing how well somebody learned. I think that's pretty good. And it's something that, that frankly, a teacher can't do, but it can enable the, manage, the magic of both the learner and the instructor. And I've got one quick slide that shows you how they do it. And again, not a commercial. I just like it. In, in the traditional way of learning, uh, you get all the information presented in a class through lectures and books. And if you study really hard, okay, that was not my skill. Initially, uh, you reach a peak of what you know. But it fades really, really quickly. That black curve, it just fades dramatically 80% in a very short time down to near nothing. But using artificial intelligence and cognitive science, the really bright uh, scientists and engineers at Sergo, found that they could watch how somebody learns and not just did they get the question right or wrong, but um, when will they, rem how long will they remember it and when will they forget it? And the key to that is they learned that, they learned that when you learn something, as it's fading from your memory, there's a point of desirable difficulty, that line you see in the middle of the chart. And if you are, uh, if you retrieve the information that you still kind of remember just as it's fading from your mind, you'll retain it longer next time and so on and so forth. And that's what Sergo does. Again, not a commercial, but it's pretty magic because you learn better, but you retain about four times as much. That's shown in some of the studies. The beauty of it is it takes half the time. And time is money, and uh, so you learn faster and better, and it feels better because we all learn differently. So if, uh, my friend Ross Rowley, who I had on Figments, The Power of Imagination, last week, a mathematician, a great student, he's going to learn differently than I will. He'll get bored if he has to go at my pace. I'll get overwhelmed if I have to go at his pace. 
And this approach using artificial intelligence end to end uh, puts us at our own pace and the learning feels better. Now that's some artificial intelligence magic. It also provides, and this gets into an area that we should all be concerned about, uh, potential risk from artificial intelligence because we can provide, because it looks at millions of, not jellyfish, millions of, of elements of how you're learning a topic, well, you get some real insight into the learning capability and the retention of an individual student or a collective group. group. On the plus side, that enables a professor, an instructor, a trainer, teacher to know how folks are doing, know what they're struggling with, put the classroom emphasis or the one-on-one -on -one emphasis on the areas that are troublesome and recognize, okay, they've got that and leave it alone and not waste their time with it. Um, but you get a lot of insight into the individuals with it. So I think artificial intelligence and the cyber stuff in learning and education is very powerful and something that can revolution how well we all learn, regardless of our modes of learning. So cyberspace, good and evil, they're both out there. Uh, and the risks are clear, but the benefits are myriad as well. I have forgotten the last couple of shows to address what would FIG do, because we're talking Cyber Monday. FIG would be real careful, and I am, about what I share online, about the security systems and programs that I have, about using two-factor identification. Um, but remember, two-factor identification doesn't always work. I, did a webcast or a webinar rather for the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum last week on the attack on Midway. And many of you know, the Japanese code was broken, so they knew where they were going. But the Japanese in a cryptological sense had two-factor authentication and double encrypted the dates and time. But guess what? The Americans figured that out too and knew not just where, but when. So, Check your security, be careful, change your passwords, all those things, please. Wow, that, that passed quickly in a cyber flash, if you will. I hope you found it informative. Uh, I thank, as always, Think Tech Hawaii, a great organization for uh, the over 20 years for hosting our shows, and they are a nonprofit. Go to thinktechhawaii.com and see how you can support with a donation, big or small. Uh, they need your help to do their wonderful work and give so many voices in cyberspace to the Hawaiian community and really around the world. Please join me Monday for Figments, The Power of Imagination, and talk to Slick Aguirre, who dreamt he could fly and fly and fly, and he did. So mahalo and aloha. Thank you.